birthday or anything we should know about before I move on? Nope, all good. Okay, good. And of course, Peter can't join us because he's somewhere in the south of France, still wearing some pants somewhere, I think. And uh, Jim Augustine, good to see you too, my friend, and, uh, and everybody else on the call. Thanks for joining us once again. And thank you for recording this, Angus, and we'll move on. And again, I've made the introduction of Owen Long, who's going to give us a presentation. Uh, name, before I do that, uh, name, what is the actual title of the uh, group that you direct and run right now? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, my name's Owen, uh, and I, my title is the Director of First Responder Training for the American Red Cross. So I'm responsible for a first responder group that oversees account management and support for police, fire, and EMS agencies. Uh, on behalf of our new resuscitation suite program, and I say new as a relative concept, um, new to the rest of, compared to the rest of our program. So we've been around for first aid, CPR, AED, lifeguarding, you know, wilderness first aid. We've we've played in in those uh, ponds for quite some time, but this is one of our our newer approaches. And I have a little bit of a history of how we got here. Um, but yeah, the first responder training team. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Can I just get a quick verification? Everybody can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Cool. Awesome. And I, I just want to make sure I can't see anybody, so it's it's difficult for me to uh, kind of gauge the interest here. So if you have anything, just come off mic and, and by all means say it. Um, so again, my name is Owen Long. I represent the American Red Cross First Responder Training Team um, in an initiative where we have uh, really pursued our relationships with police, fire, and EMS agencies, specifically fire and EMS agencies. Um, to look at a different approach to their BLS, ACLS, and PALS training programs. Uh, for many years, we have we have gathered information, and especially from field clinicians, medical directors, um, training centers, et cetera, that we basically, we teach these classes from the AHA, and we teach them as a checkbox. Um, and, and that's not to say that the AHA doesn't have great classes. It's not to say that, you know, there's one better than the other, uh, but they're a checkbox course, right? We have to take ACLS, so this is the way that we do it. And we have to take our CPR every two years, so we're gonna sign up for our CPR class um, and, and we're gonna check that box. Uh, we, we really wanted to take a, a very different approach to that. And we wanted to look at the what we call resuscitation suite or alphabet course trainings, the BLS, ACLS, and PALS, and look at it a little bit differently. Look at it as an opportunity uh, for practice for what the clinicians are ultimately doing in the field. So first and foremost, we wanted to put at the front of our, our initiative, the ability to customize our ACLS, our PALS and our BLS classes to the medically directed protocols. Meaning we don't want the, the clinician uh, or, or the instructor sitting in class and saying, okay, this is the way that the book says, and this is the way the national model says, but forget that once you leave the classroom, we need you to do it this way. We would like to see consistency across those two, uh, I guess, avenues for training and see them kind of integrated into one to where that that experience in the classroom becomes most similarly replicated of that of the field. How did we come across this this kind of, I guess, opportunity to speak to Dr. Antebi? It was very simple. Everybody in EMS is using the Antebi app. Uh, so we were continuing to hear, well, can we use this in training? Can we, you know, have them pull it out like they're on a code on the back of a medic unit, right? So, so we're really trying to, to kind of hear what the field was doing. And, and I took it kind of upon myself, to be honest, to reach out and say, Dr. Antebi, what are your core values of your program? What are you doing that is getting so much buy-in from these clinicians, from these medical leadership uh, agencies, from these, these full states that are, are buying into this? And he's very uh, open in sharing the fact that we are partnering with them in a customizable fashion to make their jobs easier, use their protocols, and ultimately give them more experience and training in what they will be doing in the field. So I said, well, we are too. <laughs> um, so, so it really became a very synergistic conversation um, because our goal is to, again, create that level of customization. So I say that in, in understanding that we have provided kind of a broad set of course objectives that we we don't compromise, right? So so we have course objectives that are set. Um, they are built based on field core guidelines and of what needs to be covered in a BLS class, an ACLS, and a PALS class. Uh, and ultimately, we have a line in our instructor's manual that says, okay, you know, this is what we're putting forward, but 
we would rather you replace this information with medically directed local protocol. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not providing you the modalities to deliver, to deliver these trainings. We are giving you the e-learnings, just like the heart code model with, with the AHA. We are giving you the instructor's manuals that are all available for download. We are giving you all the PowerPoints and the lectures, but that doesn't mean they cannot be augmented with videos that you use. For example, maybe you're using a very specific assignment for pit crew CPR, uh, or maybe you're, you're working on, on giving a class that is specific to the engine companies that are arriving on the scene. We encourage that to be integrated into these slide decks and into these presentations and ultimately even used for students to prepare for our courses as sometimes we have agencies that elect just to use our course as the final test out. So that challenge program where they actually demonstrate the skills that they've learned in a, in a uh, protocol education course and then use our course to gain certification as a result of that. Um, the challenge course is what I was referencing there. Again, this is this is allow allows for that customization completely prior to the actual administration of the final exam and the mega code um, to where you can actually build your education, put our challenge course at the end of it as a test out, uh, again, applying the protocol and, and it can be used as a certification based, um, uh, I guess they will achieve a certificate through that. Um, so it becomes kind of, I guess, converted from just a practice or, or a training into a certification-based course, knocking them both out at once. We do have four delivery methods, this online only, do not fret, that is not a, a course that is um, applicable to BLS, ACLS, and PALS. That's more of our kind of public-facing community education type stuff. Um, but we do do that blended learning where they can actually take the online modules prior to coming to class and then, and then they do a, a in-person skill session that is catered to that of the, the agency. Um, we do an instructor-led training, which is start to finish um, in, in the classroom, uh, butt in the seat type deal. And then our review and challenge courses, again, shorter courses that allow for recertification um, and still sit in line with those, those competencies of the local agency. Our courses are designed and reviewed specifically for first responder agencies. Um, so we have a very unique in-depth EMS practice and testing scenario bank. Um, I, I do wanna point out here that we do title our course just slightly differently for the ACLS side of things. We actually title it ALS, Advanced Life Support. Uh, and we did so not because there's a patent or, or any sort of copyright infringement um, on ACLS, but rather we, we do take a little bit broader of an approach uh, where AHA kind of segments out their courses. We have the ASLS, the ACLS. Ours is kind of all lumped into one. Um, so it, it does include the cardiac interventions, the respiratory and pulmonary interventions. Uh, we look at shock pretty pretty heavily. And then ultimately we, we address trauma in those classes as well. Uh, our pharmacology, we do have pharmacology specific to EMS. And again, that can be further drilled down to the pharmacology associated with your agency. Um, and then ultimately the, what's programmed into your hand heavy app and then we do have uh, visual aids that are prepared for that of, of the scenarios representing the field. Um, I actually recently just finished a, a partnership with iSimulate. So I don't know if you have any agencies on here that are using iSimulate, um, but we do actually have all of our programs, uh, program, or I'm sorry, all of our scenarios programmed into iSimulate as well. Um, so those EMS scenarios are all programmed into there. We do give full administrative autonomy. Uh, and I, I say this to point out something very specific. Uh, one is if you have agencies that are looking to make this transition, uh, they will be their own training center. So there's no going through a hospital. There's no going through another agency. There's no going through a rogue instructor to get cards. We do our, all of our work directly with the instructor or directly with the training center. Uh, the, the goal of this is to make the, the certificate more uh, real time so they can, they can generate that once they finish course, the course but it also uh, gives us a relationship directly with the customer and the first responder training specialist that sits on the account. So we actually work directly with the, the agency to do a full transition and then we continue to manage the account. All instructor credentials with the current agency have reciprocity with us. So we'll do an online orientation to our programs, but we do accept kind of what we call it the bridging program where it's direct reciprocity with the, the agencies that already have instructors uh, kind of alive and well in their system. Um, again, the, the main reason we see people starting to have these conversations with us usually isn't because they're they're um, actively seeking another agency. 
we have kind of seen two things. One, where they've gone away from certifications because they've, they've um, seen less value in teaching, you know, one way in the classroom and then having to totally retrain in the field. So they've just done the way with the, the certification administration at the end of it anyway. But then two, we're having these kind of one-off discussions and these discussions with large departments about integrating the, their ability to do this their way. And, and you know, the way that the, the medical director is kind of leading the, the agency and being dynamic in the approach. Um, and that's kind of where our customer base is coming from. Um, I'll say before I get into the, what a roadmap to a transition looks like, I will identify we've we've been in existence now in this space for about six years. Uh, we started with the military training network, so the entire military training network switched from the American Heart Association over to the American Red Cross. Um, so that we did that very strategically to make sure this worked, to make sure we could replicate it on on a, a high level, we could scale it, we could grow it, um, and it did. So then they built a team of field professionals to go out and, and work with police, fire, and EMS agencies on, on these types of uh, courses. Um, so in our in our inaugural year, we really we really signed some very large agencies. Um, and I don't know if any of them are on the call. So if you are, please feel free to come off mic and, and uh, testify to everything that I'm saying is, is valid and accurate. Um, but specifically, we are uh, working with DC, fire, and EMS. So they've done a full transition from AHA over to the American Red Cross. Uh, we work with Detroit Fire and EMS. We work with Norfolk News Fire and EMS. Or I'm sorry, Newport News Fire and EMS. New, uh, Norfolk Fire and EMS. We work with Prince William County, Virginia Fire and EMS. We work with San Diego Fire and EMS, Denver Fire and EMS. And, I, you know, these are just our big ones, right? We, we've worked with some other agencies that, that are very notable and, and of, of um, great size and, and ability. But I, I say that to kind of point out that we gained entrance into this market, I think, a lot quicker than anybody ever thought we would due to the, the immense ability that we give to the, the end agency. I'm very specific, and I, when, I, when I say who we give the end autonomy to, the end autonomy is not the instructor, to be very clear, um, because we don't want instructors to go rogue. It is not CPR, ACLS, or PALS by XYZ instructor. It is CPR, ACLS, and PALS by X agency. Um, so it is, it is absolutely not uh, a presentation of, of, hey, you know, go teach whatever you want. Uh, it, is, it is definitely comes with quality control and assurance, specifically from a national level with us. We do have a quality assurance and audit team um, that sits at the national level that, that enforces compliance and regulation within our programs. Uh, when you do kind of want to take a look at, at making such a transition within the space of this, this uh, ACLS, BLS, and PALS training, we, we highly encourage you to, to kind of follow this roadmap to transition and implementation, if you will. Um, so it would start with just a consult with our fire and EMS uh, specialists. So you, we would do an analysis of your current training, look at why you are interested in making the switch, talk about what your end goals are. Um, we assign a first responder training specialist to the, the uh, uh, navigation process. We then start with an agreement. We give you a, a licensed training provider agreement where your agency becomes licensed to use our programs. Uh, and then we bridge all your current instructors and we look at other instructors that may have um, similar credentials or lapsed credentials where we could maybe give them an orientation to our programs to revitalize their ability to teach. Uh, and then ultimately we would establish your account structure and, and uh, training paradigm so that way you are fully autonomous to be able to deliver these training programs. Um, your account support does not go away. We are, we are there for your first class to make sure you feel supported and, and kind of see that this actually does come to life. Um, it is a different different model than what people are used to. And I, I applaud the Red Cross for being willing to step into this space. And the growth is going to be astronomical and very quick um, as we kind of navigate into this, this new era. I, I don't wanna dump all of this on you guys because I know that it is just supposed to be a very brief overview. And, and I told Dr. Antebi that this was just gonna be kind of a scratch the surface. If there's anybody that's interested, we'd love to speak with you. We'd love to be able to kind of further have discussions on where this could maybe lead uh, based on the ge geography of where you are. I'll assign kind of an appropriate conversationalist there with you. Um, and, and our goal is to continue to obviously pursue the Red Cross mission. Um, so we are very local with our disaster relief in all communities in the United States. We, you know, have, have partnered with you guys for a lot of agencies in the fire service with sound the alarm campaigns, disaster relief, rehoming after house fires, et cetera. And all of the proceeds that do come from Red Cross training um, actually go back to the mission of the American Red Cross. 
I say that to, again, we'll talk budget for just one hot second. Uh, I just had a conversation with Dr. Roach this week and he was like, so what does all this cost? Um, when we were, we were down in Broward County and um, I, <laughs> I will tell you there's, for all of the things that you see on this map, there's absolutely no cost associated with any of it. Um, you, the only thing you ever actually pay for with the American Red Cross is the cost of the certification card itself. Uh, so, so even if you, you aren't sure if this is somewhere where your agency may benefit or, or wanted to just try it and see what it's all about, um, I'm not here to try and sell you anything or, or waterfront property in you know Nebraska because that's just not going to happen. But um, you know, this is it's something that we put out there at your full kind of disposal to be able to try it out as as you please. And that's all I have. Very brief, um, nothing crazy. I wanted to open it up for questions, comments, or or anything uh, before I, I hop off. Great. This has been great and really eye opening. And thank you again for having this across the nation. It sounds like already. So that actually brings up an interesting point. There are some states that are highly regulated and they have these committees that decide what your protocols are going to be or how you're going to do training and so on. And then there's some that are actually uh, well directed often by the local medical director or dictated by that. So there's a, there's a span. So when you get to the states, for example, that have, uh, let's say, regulations. Are you OK on all those states in terms of they say, do they say you have to be trained or each of your paramedics have to be trained in uh, a heart association and or you know equivalent uh, or have you run across that or where, where are you on that one? Or is that been a roadblock? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. And has that been a roadblock? I would have said three years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then we put together a team that gained us all 50 states plus the District of Columbia approval at the statewide level. Um, so we worked with the Departments of Health to be able to be, be either written into code or written as an equivalent to the AHA. Um, so we've gained that and we have a lot of literature that supports our equivalency that we, we share in very early conversation. Um, I'll tell you, to be totally honest, where we where we hit the roadblock is, is usually um, the agency itself, actually, to where they, they are kind of like, well, we it's AHA and it's AHA and it's AHA because it's AHA, right? So we'll usually yeah. hit things on those lines, um, but at the state level, we hit the least resistance. Uh, it usually is when we get to the medical director level where we engage our chief nurse or we'll engage our our, our scientific advisory council to help us gain equivalence and, and um, acceptance at the local level uh, is where, where the intricacies usually come into play. So you may have some uh, local, uh, let's say, uh, friends here uh, in many ways uh, because of what you just said. Now, um, Wayne Lee, uh, you know, Wayne's one of our great uh, mentors and uh, one of our, 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 our wise sages in this system. So, Wayne, what's your question or, or comment? Well, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, listen, uh, Owen, uh, very nice. Yeah. Actually, I'm very involved with the Red Cross here in Broward Yay. County for quite a while. Um, and it's interesting. I, I saw that Tom uh, DiBernardo made a comment about Department of Health uh, will accept both uh, AHA is what he's saying and uh, and Red Cross. And I know we're talking mostly EMS and paramedics here. However, and I noticed you talked to Dr. Roach, who has a big title with Broward Health now. Sure. And um, one of the things that and I was involved with Broward Health, one of the things, you know, if you remember, you may not remember, but ASEP had a course that they came out with uh, a number of years ago, and so there were some competing courses, and some of the hospitals put in their contracts that the physicians had to have American Heart Association ACLS. You're shaking your head like you're familiar with that. And, Too familiar, uh, maybe, but yes. <laughs> okay. It's kind of goofy, but I wonder if you could comment about that. Of course, of course. Um, that really came down to the West. best way that I can describe it is um, when I need to blow my nose, do I grab a tissue or do I grab a Kleenex? Um, it, it kind of just is a brand name on um, which I'm going to end up grabbing, right? Um, the AHA still dominates the market and, and has always been kind of the monopoly in the space. So we found that when a lot of policies and codes were being written, that was kind of the gold standard. So that was the Kleenex, right, of, of what needed to be delivered where we are kind of starting to penetrate the space and taking them one off, we built a review team to look at those policies and say, well, hey, here's all the information to write us in as an equivalent. Um, the, the FDOH was one that I helped work. Um, so we are actually written into the FDOH code where it says American Red Cross or AHA. So at the hospital level, we have a team that pursues the same things where they work to get written into to code for hospitals and to, to agreements that hospitals may have with larger health systems. 
So you would agree that that still could be in place at some hospitals? Oh, I, I am confident that that is still in play in some hospitals. Okay, just a and, good point. Everybody, it, no, it's, it's absolutely a good point. And Wayne is right up our alley for two reasons. One is there are places where when I've looked into contracts to help out as an assistant medical director, they are requiring, uh, you know, specifically PALS, ACLS, you know, whatever, those kinds of things. And that's been sort of for many of us who, of course, gotten board certified in emergency medicine has been like, what? Why do we need this on top of that? Right. So um, any event, you got the general idea. Um, so I think this is very interesting. And I'd, I'd be personally interested. Exploring this further as I get rid of this phone call here that came in at the wrong time, telemarketer. Um, but anyway, so that's it. Any other questions from the group here uh, that we can address? Anybody out there that uh, that Wayne, did he answer your question? OK, I think so. Right, because we know that it's there. I'm just trying to figure out how to turn off my hand and uh, make a good point, you know, uh, regarding the uh, the contract and uh, board certification, et cetera. And yet many hospitals still build that into uh, the requirements, you know, and then some of it, I think, is attached to the trauma centers and their requirements, you know, so it yeah. gets kind of fuzzy. But I agree with you, Paul. It's it's always been a rock in our shoe, you yeah. know. So, Doug Koopas, you've been a state EMS director and then, you know, now a medical director for NAMT. Uh, any comments or questions you have? You're uh, silent. You're muted. So yeah, I think you're muted. Yeah, I had to Cooper. figure out how to get my hand uh, not raised too. Um, first of all, my my first question, Owen, was: Are you able to post in the um, in the meeting chat here or info your contact? Yeah, uh, cool. And you know, to to other other comments that have been made out there, uh, you know, locally, our our hospital back in 2015 uh, developed our own uh, program, much because of what. Uh, some of the issues that you bring up. Um, and I think this is uh, overdue. I think it makes a whole lot of sense. When our hospital did this, we had a lot of, oh, you can't do that. You have to have an AHA. Well, uh, you know, that's that's one of the big myths. And, and they would say, well, the Joint Commission requires it or whatever. When you go back into it, the Joint Commission just wants you to follow your hospital's policies. So the hospital sets the policy. And it was a simple changing of our hospital policy. Uh, to identify what um, what CPR cards, uh, you know, the the uh, again, I don't work for uh, the state anymore, but the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, has a a list of uh, it's about a dozen different types of uh, CPR courses from the Mind Safety Administration to uh, AHA to ARC to uh, you know, Ashy, several others. yeah, many others, American right? Safety yeah. Health. So yeah. From mm -hmm. on the CPR side. So, I mean, I think many places realize that it just shouldn't be pigeonholed, but, you know, don't believe it. If you're, if people in your hospitals or wherever say, oh, the joint commission requires it or whatever, uh, you know, most of those are urban legend and it's just, uh, people are used to thinking that it has to be just one thing or that's what they're married to because they're an instructor with it. But I applaud you for the, you know, the uh, whole concept, because it makes so much more sense to uh, apply the principles, but then allow uh, local variations so that um, so there is no variation. I mean, the reason we did it was we wanted everybody, you know, bag mask ventilating the same way. We wanted everybody doing, you know, the same kind of compressions, uh, et cetera. And um and so I think that, you know, by allowing variation, you're actually causing uniformity within agencies or within hospitals and that sort of thing. I appreciate that insight and, and please feel free. I did put my contact information in, in the chat. Uh, feel free to share as, as uh, you feel fit. And even if anybody has just wants to reach out for initial consultative or more questions, things are right, shoot me an email, shoot me a text or a phone call. Um, I, I'm happy to, to handle them on the one off as well. And, and I plan to continue. Um, I have a meeting with my senior leadership here at the Red Cross and Dr. Ann Tevi uh, actually next week. So we're going to continue to look at opportunities for partnership and advancement of the, the relationship. OK, so they can shoot you a text, text you an email, but don't shoot you. Right. So all right. exactly. That's the only request. Just don't shoot me. <laughs> OK, good. Well, listen, uh, this has been great so far. And anybody else have any questions or want to pipe in or have anything else to say? Uh, and I guess I'll bump back to you. Anything else? You, we ready for transitioning over to the other side, so to speak? Um, and anything else new we need to know from the state uh, statewide level? 
Um, sure, I'll just uh, mention that um, the uh, uh, state has noticed a rulemaking session on uh, education uh, policy. If you all did not see that, it is uh, Wednesday the 9th, I believe from 9 to 11 in the morning, and there is a virtual option. So I know a lot of the medical directors on the call here have been uh, with me in discussions about our uh, statewide education uh, system for EMTs and paramedics, and that uh, is going to have some uh, a potential rulemaking workshop next week. So uh, next Wednesday, 9 to 11, there is a virtual option, and um, reach out to somebody you know at the health department if you didn't get uh, the notice. OK, so anybody else? So let's just repeat for everybody's sake in case you got on late. And thank you, by the way, for uh, I think it was Wayne or someone like that who stuck it in there. The CME uh, is 17400 this time, 17400. We're going to be now going over to 401, okay, um, on the